Every company in this room has been affected or is being affected and will continue to be affected by one, two, or three of these major trends in the industry. So one is definitely software eating hardware. Second is the rise of subscriptions uh, and even consumption-based pricing. And then the third is a move toward a digital customer experience. And, and you know, those are somewhere between one and three journeys that are hard to get right, right? Um, of all the kinds of companies that are out there in the world, the companies who probably have the most daunting challenge or the companies that grew up historically as hardware companies, right? Because not only is hardware, you know, their product was often a hardware-oriented product. And so they're moving from hardware companies to software companies. They're moving from CapEx to OpEx. They're moving from, you know, you know labor-based sales, labor-based delivery, all these kinds of things. And, and so those journeys for, you know, you know big hardware-oriented companies have got to be the toughest, the toughest journeys for any of us to go on. And, I, you know, on the one hand, you can argue those, those three trends can lead to commoditization, they could lead to, you know, disruption, market disruption, and they have for some companies. But also, they have the opportunity to create new value propositions and new kinds of customer relationships. Um, and, you know, one super fascinating story has been the rise of uh, a, an offer, an organization, whatever, within HP Enterprise called GreenLake. And um, we are, you know, I mean, HPE is a historic company. We were hearing about HPE on the stage the other day uh, and, 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 and so forth. And we are super happy to have Rohit Digzit, who is the head of Senior Vice President of Advisory and Professional Services for HP Enterprise. And uh, so, first of all, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure, JB. Uh, so, as I... As I was saying, I, I think GreenLake is one of the most fascinating stories, a story that is not as far from over, right? But one of the most fascinating transformation stories uh, in, in the industry, right? Um, and, and it is something, the ability to manage transformation, to move from old product lines to new product lines, old ways of doing business to new ways of doing business, right? Old skills to new skills is a super complex and challenging thing. And you guys have had to do all of this at a super fast rate of speed. So can, can you just begin by telling us a little bit about what GreenLake is and what the story is of GreenLake within HP Enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. Great place to start, I guess. Um, so what is GreenLake? Right. Um, GreenLake is HP's consumption-based offering. Uh, what that means is that if you wanted to buy infrastructure or a solution for some outcome that you were trying to drive, instead of buying hardware or infrastructure, what you buy is a pay-as-you-go model where you get the infrastructure plus some overcapacity. And just to keep it very simple, let's say you wanted 100 terabytes of storage. You get 120 on-prem. You don't pay for it on day one. You sign up a contract for three to, six, three to five years, and then you, you pay as you go on that. But around that is wrapped support services, managed services, et cetera. And what it does is it sort of brings that cloud-like simplicity because you only pay for what you use. But you get that cloud-like simplicity. You get the scaling. But you get other benefits, such as architectural control. You get, you know. Um, if there's latency requirements, you have regulatory environments, uh, environments that you're in which have data sovereignty issues, it helps you with that. Um, you know, there's no data repatriation, it filters into your overall security schema and all that sort of stuff, right? So at the, at the, at the risk of turning this into a GreenLake commercial, that's kind of what, what the GreenLake offering is, right? Um, 
And, and it's, it's a great example of a grassroots innovation because really where it started was uh, somewhere in one of the small countries really in North, Northern Europe. Um, almost about seven, eight years ago, I would say, uh, you know, it was some sales guy and his team who refused to take no for an answer from the company. Because the customer was talking to them about, yeah, you know, look, I, I need this consumption-based model, but I need all that controls that I was talking about earlier. And we didn't have an offer. And so this team actually cobbled something together. And once they did, you know, you could see, you could see the value of it. The customer loved it. And then, you know, I think it took us a little bit longer than I would have liked, to be honest, to understand that we had some great asset that we were sitting on. Um, and yeah, from there on, it developed into what is GreenLake, which is one of our sort of primary offerings. There's a, you know, it's, it's not just another offering on the catalog. It's actually triggered a real transformation in the company itself. And, and um, so it, it is not just a pricing methodology, right? There are, there are, you know, I mean, some people, some people could interpret that story, right? You know, that was the rise of AWS and, you know, all of the, you know, the disruptive sort of consumption-based models that were, you know, moving into the data center, right? <clears throat> so some people could have interpreted that as a defensive move. It's like, we got to offer this or we're going to lose everybody who wants to pay based on consumption or, or OPEX or whatever. But it's more than that, right? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, like, you know, I, I think if it was just, like I said, another offering on our catalog, yeah, I, I think maybe that could have been, uh, been seen as defensive. But really what we've tried to do with that offering and how it's like the catalyst for the transformation for the company that I was talking about, you know, it's, we're not playing defense with this thing. We've gone in, we, we bet the house on, on, on this offering and this way of working in the future. Um, you know, because think about it this way, right? Just to zoom out on the conversation a little bit. If you're a CIO, man, I, I tell you, you have my, you have my sympathy because, you know, if you were a CIO 10, 15 years ago, life was, I wouldn't say simple, but it was simpler, right? You bought infrastructure, um, you put it in a data center, you, ha you know, got an ITO guy to manage all that stuff for you, and, you know, uh, it was pretty straightforward. But now, when you think about it, right, so if you, let's start from the core of what a CIO does, all the infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, you've got, firstly, you've got just a complete fragmentation and an absolute uh, spread of applications, workloads, and data, structured, unstructured, all that sort of stuff, right? Now, all that is, has multiple places it can reside. It can reside in a data center, of course. It can reside in a colo. It could reside up in the cloud. Um, th there's so many options, and you have to pick and choose from those, right? Um, and, and then, of course, any data center you're left with, you've got to modernize it, you've got to transform it, and all that kind of stuff, right? So that alone is complex enough. But there's another vector that's coming into the CIO's world that I think is extremely underappreciated, and that is what we call the edge, right? It's compute at the edge. Um, you know, I'm talking about things like remote office, branch office, I'm talking about sensors in buildings, I'm talking about, you know, your devices, all that sort of stuff, right? And all of these things at the edge, they are producing more data than ever before. Not only are they producing it, they're producing it, they're analyzing it, consuming it, acting on it, all at the edge. Um, I read a study that said 70% of data in the near future will never see a data center. Right? I mean, think about what a sea change that is, right? And now if you're the CIO, you've got to deal with what's happening at the edge. And if you believe, as, as I think most of us do, that data center is the raw material of the future, then data now has to come from the edge. It has to, you know, all the transactions that need to take place, the back and forth, what to store, what not to store, et cetera, that gets very complex. Um, so, you know, if you're a CIO, you've got to think about all of these things, and then you've got to find a way of... Um, navigating what is the best option for the business outcomes you're trying to drive. Complex stuff. On top of that, process and people stuff, right? Because this extremely complex environment, how do you operate it? How do you secure it, right? Because you need an end-to-end -to -end security model now that has to encompass even the edge. So life, got, life gets really, really complex. Um, I don't think the CIOs are really looking for, oh, you know, I wish there was one more way I could buy IT. I, I don't think that, that's what's keeping them up at night. What they're really worried about, what 
in my conversations with them, what comes up again and again is, holy crap, this stuff is complex. And it is ever-changing. And there are so many choices and options that we don't know what to do. Right? So what we've tried to do is we've tried to help the CIO with that complexity. That really is the main goal. Their digital transformation is our main goal. Starting with, this is the business outcome I'm trying to drive. This is where I am now, including a complete sort of view of my estate of workloads, apps, blah, blah, blah. Here's where I need to go to, which is going to drive that outcome. Here's how my journey is, the steps in that journey. And then perhaps the most critical conversation is how do I make it all affordable, right? Because apart from all these external vectors, you can think about the pressure a CIO faces from the CFO who keeps cutting his budget. A CEO who keeps telling him that you know, he needs IT to help drive the business because IT is no longer a cost center that sits in the back. You've got entire industries now that are built on IT, like your you know, Ubers and DoorDashes or Tinder, if uh, that comes to mind first. But um, you know, you've got all these kind of businesses that are built on IT. IT is now not in the background. It is the business. And so if you're a CF, CIO, you really what you need is you need somebody to help you make decisions, help you navigate the best path forward, and help you in that transformation. And so the reason I explain all of this is because the posture we've taken, which is, I think, very, very on the front foot and very on the offense, is we've taken on the onus of helping our customers with the trans, uh, transformation, using that consumption model and offering like like GreenLake as an enabler of the transformation. They are two sides of the same coin. You can't have a transformation conversation without figuring out how you're going to consume it and how you're going to afford it. And any conversation you want to start about GreenLake, you should be starting it with a transformation conversation. So, so yeah, you know, to, to me, it's a, it's a sea change, not just an add to a catalog. It, it is fundamentally redefining the way we work at HP. Yeah, you know, um, th there, we were talking about this at in, in a session earlier today, uh, you know, is, is we used to think, as an industry, we used to think about products like, you know, hardware SKUs, software SKUs, service SKUs, all that kind of stuff. And we sold, we sold SKUs right. to the customer. And, um, and you know, n n now the customers want the outcomes, right? And they want the complexity of getting to the outcome they, they, want it, they want it to happen fast. They want it to be simple, right? And, um, and so we're evolving, and this is exactly right, I think. We're evolving from thinking about products to thinking about offers, yeah. right? And the offer is the outcome. And with the outcome comes a set of hardware, software, services, you know, whatever. And that can actually change during the course of the relationship. Absolutely. It is not one thing. No. It's what you need now, and then along the way, what you need, can, this can go up, this can go down, yep. right? And, and, and then I'm relying on the, the wisdom of my partner, right? Because, because, you know, again, I always talk about most, custom, most of our customers are an N of one, right? They know how they always did things. You have been involved with tens of thousands of companies who have been on this digital transformation journey. And at some point, it's just like, it's like, I got to trust you, right? Get me through this, yep. right? Um, but, you know, it is, it is such a different approach from a CapEx hardware skew, you know, heavy sales, you know, kind of model that we always had where it was feature function price and right. all this kind of stuff to this kind of an, an offer. And, you know, uh, there are always people in the company, so customers, this is true of customers, this is true of employees, this is true of investors who know the old way of doing business. They prefer the old way of doing business. Um, and this new thing over here, right? Sometimes the organization just wants to r reject it and go back to the old way. So, so can you tell me, like, organizationally, 
within the company. Tell me the maturity story of, of the GreenLake offer and the people who sell and deliver it. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll, and I'll, I'll also talk about the company transformation as well, right? Because yep. I mean, GreenLake is just that catalyst that's making us transform. Um, and, and yeah, look, you know, uh, these kind of changes are hard, like you said. If it was easy, many people would have done it, and, and not many have. Right? Um, and I think we are further along, and we've got the scars to prove it, right? Um, the that that sort of friction between the old way of doing and the new way of doing stuff, I, I think, is honestly, to be expected, right? Because unless you're going to flip a switch and you're going to be brave enough to say, yeah, this concept is proven enough at this point, I'm going to flip the switch and everything is going to go uh, student body right, um, you, you will have to, for at least some time, if not indefinitely, you will have to live in that bimodal world. world. Uh, because in the future, I think the world will be hybrid, and therefore the modes in which we operate are going to be hybrid. Um, so yeah, you know, look, I, I think I think that friction is to be expected, right? Uh, and we've been we've been sort of working through that friction now for quite some time, and that evolution that you talked about. Um, there, there's a couple of big learnings, at least, that came out for us on, on you know how that process works, right? Um, the first thing that helps you with with that transformation is, I would say, the what's the phrase? The credibility of your intent. Right? So let me explain what I mean by that. Anytime change happens, I think most employees want to make sure that you mean what you're saying, right? That this is not just something and this too shall pass, right? They want to make sure that what you're saying is, is what you're going to do and that you will be consistent in that intent. And that's really, really important because they watch for the first tough decision that you have to make or the first couple of tough decisions you have to make. And if you don't make those tough decisions, you lose credibility on that, and now that journey is shot, right? Um, the first time sort of that the rubber meets the road and you back off, right? I, I, the saying I use is your first step back is your last step forward, right? You, man, once you lose that credibility, you're done, right? So the first thing is... If you're going to live in that bimodal world and you want to remove that friction that you talked about, you have to establish that credibility. Um, the second thing, a point is about clarity. Right? You, you know, JB, I, I have a pet peeve because um, a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, the transformation is not happening because, uh, you know, if only those bozos over there, they don't get it. Right? If they got it, transformation would be done. Or, oh yeah, those guys, you know, they are antibodies. They are rejecting change. I, I don't think people do that. I, I think when, when people believe in what they're doing and they believe that the company is going to support them and where they're going to go, I think they actually want to change, right? But what they need, apart from that credibility of your intent, is they need clarity on what the hell the change means, right? And understanding, well, what, what is the change in strategy? What does that mean for financials? What does that mean for the operating model? Lastly, perhaps, what does it mean for my org structure and stuff like that? But you have to go on that journey with clarity as to the implications of the change that you're about to make. See, I mean, as general managers, uh, you, you know, you run a company, I run a business. I think we can navigate through most stuff as long as we have clarity as to where we're going and what, what that means and the trade-offs we have to make, right? So to me, the second thing is you've got to start the journey with, if not 100% clarity, fair amount of clarity as to what the journey entails, right? Um, and then the third piece is communication, right? It, it, it's fairly sort of easy to say and simple, but making that communication of why you're making the change, how you're going to make the change, what does that change mean for the specific person in that audience, and therefore what is the benefit that they're going to get out of that. You have to really communicate that till you're blue in the face, because only when you're tired of saying it is when they've started listening. Right? That's, that's how communication works. Um, but I, I think those three things, right, the, the, the credibility of your intent, the clarity of the implications, and that, that very clear and consistent and often communication, I think, is very, very important. I, I know it sounds easy, you know, but I, I think that's where really, um, if you don't nail this, the next step in which you're trying to navigate all the impacts on the value chain you're dead in the water before you start that process. You need these first three things to bring the whole organization along with you. Without that, the friction remains, and it'll never go away. So, you know, you, 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 you told two, two stories. You said, one, this was basically a field-engineered offer 
in, in one of the Nordic countries or wherever it was. Mm -hmm. And so you said that. And then you said just a second ago, in order to make this transformation, you have to have you know, clear, consistent, strategic intent, which, which what I heard is, uh, I have to hear from the CEO, the employees have to hear from the CEO on down. That's right. That this is, this is what we're gonna go do, right? Okay, so how did this go? I mean, you talk about opposite ends of the spectrum, a field engineered offer yeah. to win a deal, to this, the CEO saying, this is the transformative catalyst to, to change HP. Right. How did it go from here to there? Yeah, you, you know, it really was the, the, this, this grassroots movement, right? Uh, one of the guys created this solution along with the team, of course. Um, and then next thing you know, you know, they're going out and doing reference selling, right? And they're selling more and more of this stuff. And then the other countries around that country, they start to pick up on it. They start to sell it. And, you know, I, I think it was one of the reviews that you have when you go to a geography and suddenly the numbers start to look good and you go like, hey, man, uh, <laughs> you're obviously doing something, right? What is it? And then they showed it to us and we were like, holy macro, this is, this is brilliant and this is really good. We need to find a way of scaling it. And then once we decided to scale it, we had to put a lot more sort of structure around it. Uh, we added more things to it that, you know, that they couldn't do locally. But uh, and to the point where now it is, like I said, the catalyst for the transformation. And our CEO, it was a, like a couple of months ago, basically said that his day job now is the transformation. So to your point about you know, the, the intent top down, the intent is very clear. This is, this is the company transformation, and it hinges all on linking transformation and consumption. So, so there are two, you know, I, I think, very important n notions, which is what, is what is the transformation journey? And then what is the, the catalyst? What is the message? And, and I think you answered the, 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 the issue of the message. Why are we doing this transformation? Because it's what our customers want, right? That's absolutely that, right. That, and, and that is such a powerful place to stand. Right, you know, when you think about you think about the you know the, the the challenge that a CEO has or a CFO has in dealing with investors and saying we're going to go on this journey that's going to be disruptive to our business model, it's going to be disruptive to the partners, you know, all those things, and and you know, and it's going to be hard, and it's not going to be perfect, right? You know, n nobody wants to go have that conversation because they're worried about what the backlash is going to be you know, in, in the market, right, to their yeah. stock. And, and so, you know, some people say, I just don't want to go do it, right? Or I'm going to go a little bit or those kinds of things. But, but underlying all of that is one very powerful comment, which is this is what the customers want us to be for the future. And if I don't get there, if I don't get there, then I've done the investors a massive disservice. Absolutely. Then right. I have no business left. That's right. Right? So it's not like this is an option. This is the way customers want to begin to consume us in the future, and we have got to get there, and we've got to get good at this. Right? Yeah. And, and also convincing yourself and, and the community that this is what the customer wants, and by the way, I can make money doing it this way. Yeah. Right? And if you yep. can link those two things together and show a yep. clear path of how, yep. how those two connect, I yep. think then you're onto something. So, so then, you, then you start to say, so you basically said, there's a good idea. There's a super good idea. Customers are really responding well, getting great results, we're growing. And, and GreenLake today is the fastest growing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Fastest growing product yeah. in the company, or offer in the company by quite a bit, right? Yep. Okay, so somebody said, that's a super good idea. And then you said, but, that's the way they're doing it is it's the best they could do, but we could do better, right? And so then you say, okay, how do we scale this, right? And how do we make the offer better? So on that journey, you, this offer had to make a few stops, <laughs> right? Yep. So one of the places, because, because you have built a digital customer experience around this offer that did not exist before. That's right. Right. So, so it was not like we just gotta, you know, change the comp plan and go. 
we've got to build a different kind, a, a advanced capability in the product teams. Yep. So tell me about how you got, again, you know, traditional SKU based, yeah. you know, hardware oriented, you know, to really say, we're going to go in and take this thing and yeah. really go with it. <laughs> yeah, this is where the aspiration meets reality, right? Right. Um, Mike Tyson, the great philosopher, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I think somebody was asking him about, oh, you know, it was fight before Evander Holyfield, um, and somebody asked him, hey, so, you know, Evander Holyfield says he has a plan on how he's going to fight you. And Tyson said, everybody's got a plan till I punch him in the mouth. Right, which I think is kind of how we felt when our aspirations met that reality of the way we were doing work, right? Um, but no, you're right, is that it had, it had those effect on every element of our value chain, right? And when I say value chain, I mean, you know, how did we create the portfolio? How do we figure out what accounts and what personas do we go after? How do we go to, go, go to market? How do we change our internal processes? I mean, it had an, a knock-on effect on everything. And I think we tried to predict as many of those as we could. I think we got some of them right. We, bl we were blindsided by quite a few, and we, I really wish we'd spent more time just analyzing that clarity that I was talking about before, right, that if we'd had that clarity. But, but to your specific point about you know, the front end of the value chain, let's start with portfolio, for example. Um, like most traditional companies, BU-focused, siloed, if you can call it that, right? Everybody's got a roadmap, and that roadmap is, um, let's say it, it's, it's all in parallel and it's non-intersecting, if that's the yeah. best way I can put it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, from there, you have to take these guys and say, hang on, we're going to sell a solution and that solution is going to have a bunch, a little bit of yours, some of that. It's going to have these services. It's going to have this kind of financial construct wrapped around it. And now you're doing a completely different type of product creation, offering creation, portfolio management, and what have you, right? Um, we tried a couple of different ways. Uh, eventually, what we found out was probably the best way to do this was to create a small team um, that could make decisions quickly with clarity and sort of move the ball forward, because otherwise we were just stuck in internal quagmire. Uh, but there were two things that we learned later on that we needed to tackle. Um, the first one is, uh, this, will, this will surprise you guys, but you know, technology, product portfolio guys, they have a very much of a, you know, if you build it, they will come sort of mentality, right? So when you create, the, when you create that small team, you gotta have not just have product guys in it, you gotta have somebody from go to market representing the voice of the customer. You gotta have somebody there who's also thinking about delivery, because at some point this stuff has to be delivered and has to see the light of the day, and you cannot create solutions without figuring out delivery, you have to get to it very quickly. So that's, that was the first lesson is, you know, create a small team, have it represent multiple factors, customer and back end, and, and, and you know, have them go in such a way so that it's not a, it's not a you know, um, something that when it meets the light of day, it falls apart. The second thing was um, we also learned that just having a small team working off, squirreling away off to the side also was not a good idea because eventually when this thing did meet light of day, it, it, you didn't want tissue rejection to happen. Right, so you didn't want the whole not invented here sort of syndrome taking place. So what we did was we created that small team and then we created a community around it, which was in the racy terms would be more communicated and informed and feel like they were participating in that process so that when it did come out, there were people ready to adopt it, evangelize it, take it forward, which really helped with scaling, right? Because otherwise it was like we would get to a few units and then we would die. But this really helped us with the scaling. So those were two really important lessons we learned on the portfolio side. So when, so, so you had this team, so you took this idea, you formed a small team around it, you, you made, and they were cross-functional in nature, and, but they were like a two pizza box team, right? They, yeah. could, they could work together, Very figure much. stuff out, make decisions, and go on. And, 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 then, and then you went and you said formed, which is I think very interesting, you formed a community which I assume is more players from more different parts of, of the business. That's right. Right, okay. And, and somewhere on that journey, this went from probably a bootstrapped financially, just you know, pay-as-you-go bootstrap model to a well-funded corporate Absolutely. initiative, like you know, 
When did that happen? Um, was there a moment? Or yeah, was it... there, there definitely was a, a very distinct moment when that decision was made uh, and when you know, we got branding involved to come up with the name for the offering. And I, I, think, I think what it was meant to be was that this would be so successful that we would have a lake full of green dollars. I, uh, maybe, I like perhaps, it. Perhaps, perhaps. I, I like it. Okay. But this is a post-fact, I think, yeah. a little bit. Um, but uh, the, yeah, so, so you're, you're right. We did have this community, and then, and then as it started to grow, um, you know, once we sort of fi figured out that we did have something here, the first version was fairly rudimentary, and it was called FlexCap, flexible capacity, right, uh, which meant you could flex up and down the capacity that you had for the infrastructure. And then as we added more and more offerings to it, and it started to really gain um, traction, that's when it became a, B, a separate business unit. Uh, we called it Green Lake, and we had somebody whose sole per job was to run BU, to create the portfolio, blah, blah, blah. And a, a lot of learnings even through, you know, the whole portfolio creation itself was, was interesting. The go-to-market was even more interesting, right? Because now you start to get into, well, what accounts am I going to target with this? Because you can't go after the traditional accounts, but you can create things like, you know, what we called it the transformation propensity model. Um, and you can use AI and stuff like that to figure out what accounts are ready for the kinds of transformation conversations you want to have. Um, but what was even more challenging was, as you think about how you're going to cover these accounts, which have different transformation propensity, um, it creates churn in your current coverage, right? And once again, that friction shows up, right? Um, somebody's used to being in an account. He covers that account really well because his brother-in-law works there and uh, gives him a call whenever he needs some hardware refresh. Now you're telling him, no, you've got to go cover a completely different account because that has a transformation propensity. So, you know, we were trying to m balance the risk between showing up to the right account with the right conversation, but at the same time not creating so much churn that, you know, the, the, the go-to-market model broke. So that was one challenge we, we, we faced. The other one was less account-centric, but more, I guess, persona-centric, right? Because traditionally, if you were out there just schlepping boxes, you were probably having a conversation with maybe the CIO, maybe the infrastructure guy, definitely the procurement department. Now when you're having transformation conversations, you're talking to an entirely different community. And what we figured out was we didn't know what language they spoke, right? We didn't know how they looked at the world. We didn't understand the KPIs that they were trying to drive. So that was another huge learning for us um, that we try to solve with uh, addressing our go-to-market motion, both direct and on the indirect side. So so let me pick up on, on this. So you had the traditional sales teams, right? And they sold, well, I'm, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overstate uh, this, the traditional products in the traditional way. Mm -hmm. That's not overstated. And, and, then, okay. <laughs> and, and then you said, that's not how GreenLake, that's not how we're going to be good at GreenLake. Yep. So, you know, not only do I have to change the portfolio, but I need people, I need conversations with customers who are ready, willing, and able to go on this journey, yep. who want to embrace the sort of the, the promise of this offer. I have to have people who can talk to different kinds of buyers yep. in a different language about business outcomes, yep. right? I had to go do all these things. And so you hired other sellers, other people, right? And so when you went to an account, when you picked an account, you were frequently swapping the person who was running the account. Is that right? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, what we try to do was a little bit more organic, right? Because um, the first thing that we did was we said, okay, for the direct sales force, right? Let's figure out how we can make these guys be more consultative, be more outcome-based, etc. How did right? that go? Actually, quite well. Uh, you, you know. Uh, not enough, but quite well, if I can put yeah. it that way. Yeah. Um, we created this thing we call the Digital Next Advisory Framework, just a standard framework by which people could have a conversation, because what we didn't want is multiple people having conversations with multiple accounts in multiple different methodologies. Then you don't know what the hell's working, what the hell's not working. Right. So we said, okay, at least let's standardize the methodology to have that conversation, so we created that framework. And then we created something called the Advisory Academy. So we took our sales guys, our, some of our solutioning guys, even some of our delivery guys, and we put them through this Advisory Academy, teaching them how to have that conversation. Um, and there, again, was a very interesting learning for us. The, the, the risk here is that you take a spray-and-pray approach, right? 
every sales guy has to go through some kind of you know, training in which they can have these conversations. And by the way, it's a condition for employment and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, a lot of companies do this. In fact, I think we were gravitating to that. Um, but what we realized was not everybody, not every seller we have is going to be able to make that leap forward. Um, you know, not every se seller is going to be above average, right? Uh, this, we just kind of embraced that fact, yeah. and we said, okay, instead of spray and pray, we are going to go pick individuals in each geo, and we're going to take them through this advisory academy and create that sort of group. And then over time, we will have more and more people that will go through that academy. And I got to say, I, you know, I think that was, the risk with that is it's, it's a little slower than you would like, but it paid off. I think immensely because the first interaction these guys started to have with the customer, we could see the conversations change. We could see it very, very, very quickly in the pipeline and the size of the deals. We could see it in the shape of the deals, sort of the multi-BU deals. So it was, in hindsight, that was the right way to approach it, even though the risk was that we were going a little slower than we would have liked. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we, we've said for years that it's probably a third, a third, a third, right? A third of the salespeople, right. you, you can definitely get to sell in the new way a third are never going to make it. The battleground's the middle third, right? Yeah. Through training, tools, compensation, whatever, can you get that middle third to be on, join the third who was going to get there easily, right? Yeah, you, you know, JB, um, I'll settle for the first third, right? Because let's say you have a thousand sales guys, and let's say it's a third, so you got, let's say, 300, right? Each one of those guys covers 10 accounts. That's 3,000 accounts. If I can even start there, and if I can mm -hmm. start having the right conversation with 3,000 accounts, man, I'll take that every day, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, over time, I'll worry about the, first, the next third. But right now, very, very, very much laser-focused on the first third. And did you use compensation? How, how, tell me about how, yeah. how you've used compensation with the field. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, I'll talk about a phrase I do not like at all. Um, salespeople are coin-operated, right? A lot of people say that. And my rebuttal is, well, we're all co coin-operated because if tomorrow the company stopped paying my salary, I wouldn't show up to work. So <laughs> I'm coin-operated as well, right? Yep. Um, I think sales guys, of, of course, everybody's incentive-based, uh, right? But I think salespeople sell stuff that is easy to sell. That's the first thing they'll sell, stuff that's easy to sell. Second stuff they'll sell is stuff the customer's buying, right? Because, I mean, of course, then that's easier to sell. The third thing they, the third sort of checkbox that they have is, do they feel confident standing in, up in front of the customer and explaining what the hell it is that they're selling? Because if, if they don't feel confident, they don't want to look silly, yep. and so they never push it, right? And then yes, of course, if all that stuff is there, they want, they want to be compensated, and that compensation helps. But it doesn't start and end with the compensation. I think a lot of it starts with building the confidence in the sales team that the offer is good, the offer has a strong value proposition and is differentiated. And by the way, this is how you pitch it to this kind of person. These are the benefits you communicate and all that sort of stuff, right? But so, that virtuous cycle that you were just going through there, if, if the incentives are not aligned to that from the beginning, they won't go that. I, They'll I, try to actively sell the customer out of this into that, into the old way, because they're going to make more money in the old way. You're, you're absolutely right, JV. So, so I'm not saying don't do the compensation. Yeah. I'm just saying compensation alone will not get you there, yeah. right? right, right You've right, got to right. put equal and perhaps even more em emphasis on that enablement and the confidence building for the sales team because then the, you know, the incentive is like uh, afterburners or jet thrusters on the, on the benefit from there on. Yeah. So can we turn a little bit to the, the digital customer experience journey that you're on, right? So my understanding is uh, uh, once, I, once I become a subscriber to, to GreenLake, uh, you give them a digital portal mm -hmm. that the customer can use to self-service up and flex up, flex down, right. do all, all these things. Is that right? Yep. Yep. And that was new. You built that. Yeah. And we were looking at that as a single pane of glass where they can look at any estate that they have on consumption basis with us, and now we're expanding that so that they can see the estate that is even not with HP, but they can see the entire estate from that single pane of glass. And, and, and they, can, they can, in effect, commit themselves 
to more spending more yeah. on their own. Absolutely. Right? And you've you've made that sort of super easy That's right. to do, right? So you so the key is almost regardless of how much they commit up front, get them onto the platform, get them onto this digital right. customer experience, yep. and then let the thing go, right? Yeah, absolutely. Especially, and this is sort of where the segmentation comes in, right? For simple needs which are repeated and sort of you know standardized, we offer t-shirt sizes of solutions that you can buy, right? Because that's the kind of stuff we don't want to waste sales cycles on, right? Right. So we want we want to offload that, and we want the customer to have a frictionless experience on that. And then yeah, if the if if what they're looking for is slightly more complex, then we want to get engaged. But yeah, we've created this t-shirt sizes where people can offer. Uh, pick up the offer by themselves through the portal. So, uh, so for, you know, at, at the present time, I, uh, in order to get the portal, I talk to a salesperson, right? And, and we go through a process of trying to get, make sure we got the right solution for you and, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And then I get the portal, and then I can largely self-service. That's right. You know, at least on the more basic things, I can yeah. self-service as a customer. Mm-hmm. I don't have to talk to a sales rep every time I need to scale something up. Oh. Okay. Will there be a day when I can get the portal without talking to a salesperson? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can go on, if, if you wanted, you could go sign on on the portal, buy some standardized offering off the portal. And that's the plan, is that eventually more and more stuff will get added on to the portal for somebody to buy just, you know, Yep. standardized t-shirt sizes. Did you have to go, I mean, a lot of us as we tr- transition from, you know, sort of uh, pay as an asset, CapEx upfront, you know, to, to OpEx, um, and, and especially because the offers themselves are actually different, right? You, you got to say, you know, what's the profitability, yeah. right? What's the profitability of the new offer and how does it compare to the old offer, right? And, um, and, and but, but that's not even the end of the conversation, right? Because you have to say, how big is the TAM? Is the, the old offer TAM is shrinking, the new offer TAM is expanding, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So, so I'm sure you, because, you know, Antonio had to go to the street and say, we're heading somewhere, yeah. right? Because customers want there. And the next question was, well, what is there going to look like? Right. Right. So who was involved in doing, and again, back to your segmentation thing, it's not just which customers are ready to transform, but which customers can we transform profitably? Right. So, so who did all that modeling work? Yeah, I mean, it was we, our corporate strategy guys got involved, the business unit guys got involved, uh, of course, the finance team was involved. Um, and what we were looking for, one was, as you said, uh, the TAM. You know, is there enough market for this? And there's enough research now to tell you that consumption models are going to be very soon the primary way in which people consume um, services, right? So, so that's one. So the TAM was there. What we did find was when we were engaging the customer in that conf- conversation, the deal sizes were bigger, the margins were good, because we were able to include more things and more sort of offerings into that. So, so it checked the margin box. And then what really was the stickiness aspect of, of things, right, that once somebody does buy GreenLake, they tend to stay with us for a very, very long time. And what you start to accumulate is ARR, right, uh, annual recurring, re- recurring revenue. And that, you know, as long as you're building the backlog of that, uh, the street loves that story because uh, it's, you're now, you're not starting every quarter afresh. You've got enough backlog where they, ha- they get a much better sense of the predictability of the business, and that's been really positive. So in, in you know, again, th- this is, I, I just think this is such a cool story because, you know, I mean, this is a big ship to turn. Yeah. And um, that ha- had a very long tradition, very long history, doing things a certain way. And there's a point, I think, at which y- you get over the hump and you know you said that you know that your ceo your ceo is now saying you know my full time job yeah right is to make make this happen right um, and then then the rest of the you know it, it, when you get to that point people start to see their futures as being related to how they can link up to the new absolutely thing. Is yeah. that, can you talk, is that happening? Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? Um, you know, 
uh, I run advisory and professional services, right? Um, for the company, not just for GreenLake, right? But now what, we've do, what we do is every conversation that we have with the customer, if we can enable them their transformation through GreenLake, you know, that conversation is immediately had. We've gone out and taught GreenLake sellers how to have transformation conversations, right? So just a small example of how it's affected my business. And, and the amount of business I do with GreenLake is like exponentially increasing every quarter. Um, same thing for the product, uh, product guys. The products that they sell through GreenLake, exponentially increasing. So yeah, I mean, it's touching everything. It's touching everything, and we talked about the portfolio stuff, we talked about the, the go-to-market and all that sort of stuff. But you know, it's, it's immensely touching the back end, right? The back end, if you think about pricing, um, T's and C's, writing statement of works, uh, all that kind of stuff. I mean, we are having to really rethink how all of that stuff works because the way it works in the future model is not the way it worked in the past. And, and so, you know, again, the, the, the antibodies in, in the organization, they, a, a, again, as this thing, st st it starts to become clear that this is the future, right? Um, then either the antibodies self-select out, yeah. or, you know, again, those people who weren't invited, those sell sellers who weren't inv invited to the academy, they start raising their hand and That's say, right. oh, yeah. can I please go to the academy, yep. right? Yep. Because, and so th that is when, you know, that is the beautiful moment. That's right. That's right. when you sort of tipped, over, tipped the scale over and that is, that is a beautiful moment, yes, yep. absolutely. So tell me where you think Green Lake evolves from here. It, it, and and I, you know, I'm gonna use the brand as a proxy for that conversation. So. So, you know, because at some point, you know, there's the old, there's the new, the old's this big, the new is this big, then you go through this transformative process, and the, the, the new gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and the old gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Pretty soon the business That's right. is the new, right? I mean, so metaphorically anyways, is HPE going to become GreenLake? Um, absolutely. I mean, you don't absolutely. need GreenLake anymore. It's, this will be HPE, it, the it new is. HPE. No, absolutely, JV. And in fact, uh, our CEO has publicly said that in the, over the course of the next three years or so, everything we offer will be available as a service and will primarily be sold as a service in a consumption model. So th this is, I mean, this is the future of HP, and you're absolutely right. Maybe we won't need the brand anymore. It'll be synonymous, or it'll be like, you know, how AWS is to, uh, is to Amazon or Azure is to Microsoft, that people, it's a standalone brand where people understand what that is, what it does, and how important it is to the central transformation of the company. Yeah. Well, but, I gotta tell you, I, as I said, started off by you know, saying that, that the longest journey, the hardest longest journey in, based on the trends that are happening in this industry right now is for traditionally hardware Yes. Centric oh, absolutely. businesses, absolutely, and and to go in how many years? Well, seven or eight. That is phenomenally fast. That is phenomenally fast. And and if you, you know, if you get to that point of critical mass, it, even in another three years, yep. a ten-year transformation of a, how big is the company? Twenty-five billion. Yeah. How many employees? Seventy thousand. Yep. That is phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> performance. Yeah, no, it, it, it absolutely is. And, but you know, the journey is not complete yet, right? Uh, to your point, I mean, that tipping point that we are so looking forward to, uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff still to be done, right? Because right now, the way I would describe it, JB, is that you've, we've got a value front end, right? That's having these conversations with the customer that's all about value, value, value. And we've got a back end that's volume, right? Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, I had just moved into a region, it was North America, and I, I was running all of services, and I, just, I, I used to live in Singapore before that. I had just moved back to the U.S. and uh, you know, met the MD of the, uh, of, the, of the geography. And he told me, he's like, Rohit, I'm going to do you a huge favor. And I was like, you're going to do me a favor? Oh, okay, <laughs> those are my favorite kind of favors, right? So <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. So he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell every sales guy 
they owe me five Green Lake deals in their pipeline by the end of this quarter. And dude, you're going to be rolling in it, right? And I was like, oh, phew, sounds good, right? Holy macro, what a mistake that was. What an absolute cluster that was, right? Because what happened was, the first thing is, this, they went and told the sales guy, so the sales guy looked at whatever it was already in his pipeline, and he said, I think I can tag that as Green Lake, I'm gonna tag that as Green Lake. Or they were like, oh, this deal's never gonna close, I'm just gonna tag this as Green Lake, <laughs> right? So I got a lot of garbage in the pipeline. It, it exploded. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> it was yeah, another kind yeah. of explosion I was looking for. And then, obviously then, you know, you're trying to transact these deals, but it's going through a, a back end that is not intended for those kinds of things. And we didn't have scale at that point, so you know, the systems were very rudimentary. And it, it clogged up the back end, and we couldn't churn deals fast enough. And then I think, you know, so not only did that pipeline dribble down very quickly, but something much, much, much worse happened. It gave the sales guys an excuse not to bring in the next Green Lake deal. Right? Because the other thing was, oh, well, no, I bought you a Green Lake deal. You guys sat on it, didn't do anything with it, so I'm not bringing you any more Green Lake deals. Oh, oh my God, that was like such an absolute mess. We had to unwind and, you know, had to go back, build that credibility, all that kind of stuff, right? But the, the point of that is, you know, I think if the front end and the back end don't match, you're setting up yourself up for complete failure. And we still have work to do on the back end, right? Um, like pricing. You know, you have a Green Lake deal that has multiple products, be using it. If the customer wants a 20% discount off of something, well, who gives up the margins, right? How does pricing on that work? And so, you know, we've found ways of, we call it the proportionate pain principle, which basically means if the customer wants 20%, everybody gives 20% off of their, um, off of their budgeted margins. And, and, you know, we've figured out things like that. We figured out MOUs we already pre-signed so that you don't have to go through pricing approval every time. Yeah. So we are finding ways of making it work. And now we're starting to do it much more systemically. But, but yeah, you know, I think that tipping point will never happen till we get that back-end stuff figured out. Because if it's not frictionless, you cannot scale it. Um, and scale is what we now need to tip it over. Yeah. You know, um, I started off by talking about these three disruptive trends, right? And, you know, there's all kind of business literature about, you know, the demise of Kodak because they missed digital and, you know, and all these things. Any one of these trends, you know, there will be companies that will not make it, right? These trends are so impactful. Oh, absolutely. It will result in the end of brands that we all know and love, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. Right, and you know, I was talking to an executive at, at Xerox, you know, and, and you, you talk about it, you know, you know, they had customers calling them up and say, "Can you please can come in and tell us how to stop printing?" Right, if you're Xerox and you make printers <laughs> and copiers, that's not, not the call you want to go have, get, yeah. right? But but at the end of the day, you know, you know, you gotta you gotta navigate this stuff, right? And and so the the you know, and the, the success or failure of the future of the company is increasingly about being able to navigate a transformation. And, you know, even the born in the cloud companies, you know, what we're learning in the last three months is that grow at all costs, right? It, you know, it is, and so there's a transformation to profitable growth That's right. that even the cloud, so we all, I don't care what you do, whether you're an old company, a new company, whatever, everybody's got to go through transformation, business model transformation, and capabilities transformation, and many companies will not make it. So I, I you know, I, the reason we wanted to bring you up here is, you know, you know, A, to provide encouragement that it can be done, but B, you know, as a community within TSIA, we've got to share these stories oh, absolutely. of how how to make the transformation, how to get sales to buy in, how to get product to buy in, right? And, uh, you know, I want to, again, go back to this, you know, this is what our customers want us to be, is a very powerful place to stand. Absolutely. And when you first started getting, look at how many customers are signing up for this, that was like the yeah. signal, right? No, absolutely. Uh, and you know, I mean, in, in the technology world, right, there's something much worse than than sort of going out of business 
which is you lose relevance. Yeah. Right? I mean, look, Xerox is still around, and yeah. you know, there's yeah. so many technology companies that are still around, but they're not relevant. Yeah. And I think that purgatory is like worse than death, right? Yeah. It's just, you're just not relevant, and the customers, yeah. you're delegated down somewhere into the procurement department because nobody wants to talk to you. I, I think that's the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. But, but look, you know, uh, I, I think the one thing I would say to everybody is obviously listen to your customer, right? But really listen. Because I think when I go back, and I think about, you know, when did we start picking up the signals? The signals actually started a long time before we picked them up. And if only we had been listening with the right intent, with not sort of the desire to explain away stuff that didn't fit into our model, um, I, I think we could have been so much further along in the journey than we are right now. So is there some seller in one of the Nordic countries who's walking around saying, I saved HP? <laughs> I'm, sure there, actually, I, there's, I'm sure there's many. I'm yeah. sure there are many. You know, yeah. Success has many fathers, right? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> yeah I'm sure. I'm well, sure listen, there thank you very much. It was a great conversation. It's a very inspiring story. And uh, thanks for your contribution to the industry. Thank you very much, Jay. My okay. pleasure.